Next, uh, continuing the coronary theme, we have Amit Kerr, who's one of the preventive cardiologists at MGH, whose research focuses on genetic predisposition to premature coronary disease. And he's going to tell us about how we can integrate both lifestyle choices and genetic information to personalize our approach to these patients. Amit, thanks so much. Good morning. My name is Amit Kara. I'm a preventive cardiologist and human geneticist at Massachusetts General Hospital. Today, I'll share results from you from a project we recently published in the New England Journal of Medicine entitled Genetic Risk, Adherence to a Healthy Lifestyle, and Coronary Disease. And I want to use these results as a framework for how we're thinking about the integration of genetic data into routine clinical practice to prevent heart attacks. For any given individual, the risk of a heart attack is determined by a complex interplay of both genetic and lifestyle factors. This is not a new observation. In fact, there's a rich history of studying these issues at my own institution. Some of you will recognize in these photos Dr. Paul Dudley White. He founded our cardiology division over 100 years ago. And he was widely credited for establishing the importance of family history and things like biking and lifestyle interventions for cardiovascular disease. Many in the audience may have explored the Paul Dudley White bike path that runs along the Charles River. Now, I recently went back and studied one of his seminal articles published in JAMA in 1951. He called it Young Candidates for Coronary Heart Disease. And in this project, he found 100 patients who presented to Mass General with a heart attack at a young age and 146 control. His experimental design was simple. He said, did one of your parents also have a heart attack? And it turns out that a family history was present in 27% of those who had had a heart attack, but only 14% of controls. Now this observation has stood the test of time, and we know to this day that if one of your parents had a heart attack, your chances of having a similar fate are increased by two to threefold. So why might this be? Well, one reason, of course, is that individuals in a family share much of their DNA. And so there's been tremendous interest over the subsequent decades to look at the three billion base pairs in our genome and dissect out which of them are driving this coronary risk. Our group recently led a large genome-wide association study, and it wasn't 100 patients, but actually 60,000 individuals from around the world who came in with a heart attack and 120,000 controls. And comparing, by comparing the genotypes of these individuals, we were able to establish that there are 60 variants scattered across the genome with robust associations with coronary risk. Now, it's important to note that each of these variants in isolation actually confers a very modest change in risk, with odds ratios in the 1.1 to 1.3 range. But you might imagine a situation where an individual inherits a disproportionate number of these risk variants. In aggregate, this impact on risk could be more significant. This is the basis for what we call a polygenic risk score. And in my last project, I computed a polygenic risk score in over 50,000 individuals, looking at these 60 risk variants, counting how many individuals had, and weighting them appropriately. And what you get is a perfectly normal distribution. And we said if you're in the top 20% of this score, you're considered high genetic risk. The bottom 20%, low genetic risk, and those in the middle, intermediate risk for coronary disease. And then we, we then asked, do these genetic risk data actually predict incident coronary events? And it turns out that they do. Here on the x-axis, I'm showing you that we followed these patients for over 20 years. And on the y-axis, their coronary event rate. And what you can see is that those individuals in the high genetic risk category seen here in blue had about a two-fold increased risk for having a coronary event as compared to those in the low genetic risk uh, seen here in blue. And so what this establishes is that I can look at someone's DNA from the time they're born and identify individuals on very different trajectories for the heart attack risk over their lifetime. Now, my current work involves the use of whole genome sequencing in over 20,000 individuals to actually repeat Paul Dudley White's experiment. If 100 patients come in with a heart attack to Mass General Hospital in 2017, what is the state of the art with regard to clinical interpretation of their genetic risk? Now, how does genetics get you to a heart attack at a young age, say by 45 years? And there's really one or two conceptual ideas. 
The first is there's a monogenic risk mutation, a single variant that has a significant impact on increasing risk. And the second, as I mentioned, is they may have inherited a large number of these common small effect variants, polygenic risk. So when I look at these 100 individuals, actually about 3% of individuals, I can identify a monogenic risk pathway mutation. In 20 to 30%, they have increased polygenic risk. And there's actually a small subset, about 2% of individuals coming in with a heart attack that had both monogenic and polygenic drivers of their coronary risk. So with regards to clinical significance, these monogenic risk pathway mutations conferred a tripling of their heart attack risk. Polygenic risk, as I mentioned, a two to three-fold increase. And if you had both monogenic and polygenic risk factors, from the time you're born, the chance of you having a heart attack at a young age was increased six-fold. So if you knew which one of these groups you were in, what would you do? And this is something that comes up in my routine clinical practice all the time. Patients come to me and they say, you know, almost everyone in my family seems to have had a heart attack, oftentimes at a very young age. And in some cases, that can lead to a sense of determinism where they feel like they may not be able to control their fate. So we asked a very simple question. If you're born on this high genetic risk trajectory, to what extent can you actually offset this risk by something like adhering to a healthy lifestyle? We included four simple healthy lifestyle criteria, not smoking, avoiding obesity, exercising regularly, and adhering to a healthy diet pattern. And it turns out that these lifestyle factors were a totally independent axis of coronary risk. With this data in hand, we were positioned to look systematically at the interplay between genetics and lifestyle for the first time as it related to heart attack risk. Here are our results. I'm now showing you only those individuals who are high genetic risk. And on the y-axis is a 10-year coronary event rate. And what you can see is that if you were born with a high genetic risk and had an unfavorable lifestyle, your chance of having a heart attack over 10 years was 11%. By contrast, those with a similarly high genetic risk but, in, but a favorable lifestyle, the risk was much lower, only about 5%. And it turns out that this pattern held true across all genetic risk data. Healthy lifestyle was associated with about a 50% decrease in myocardial infarction, regardless of the genetic hand you were dealt. So put simply, for a polygenic risk of coronary disease, DNA is not destiny. And in fact, we provide evidence that a healthy lifestyle can powerfully modify your inherited risk. So where do we stand? with the ability for human genetics to stratify the population and ultimately guide targeted therapy for myocardial infarction. As I mentioned, I can identify a monogenic risk pathway mutation in about 5% of individuals presenting with a heart attack. And in about 30%, the risk may have been driven by a polygenic risk. So what are these monogenic risk pathways? Well, some individuals have familial hypercholesterolemia. They're unable to clear LDL or bad cholesterol from the circulation. A second subgroup is in, in, unable to clear dietary fat or triglycerides after a meal. And third, some individuals increase variants that increase their lipoprotein little a. This is a cousin of bad cholesterol that's particularly atherogenic. Now it turns out that there are actually, for each of these monogenic risk pathway mutations, there's a medicine that's in current clinical use or in advanced stages of development that can actually precisely target this pathway. For those with familial hypercholesterolemia, they will drive particular benefit from early and aggressive LDL lowering with things like statins, azetamibe, and PCSK9 inhibition. For those with impaired ability to clear triglycerides, we will soon have APOC3 inhibitors to help them get that dietary fat out of their circulation. And lastly, for the first time, we have a molecule that can actually go into people's liver and turn off synthesis of these atherogenic lipoprotein little a particles using an antisense oligonucleotide approach. For those with the polygenic risk, they may not have a specific driving pathway, but we can offer at least two evidence-based interventions. First, as I mentioned, those with a high polygenic risk drive the greatest absolute benefit from adhering to a healthy lifestyle. Second, our group has shown in separate publications that statins have the greatest absolute and relative risk benefit in those with a high polygenic risk. So where can we go from here? It turns out that if a patient comes to me and asks for a comprehensive genetic risk assessment today, 
there is no product on the market. Over the next year, we will refine and modify our monogenic and polygenic risk estimates. We seek partnerships to help navigate the regulatory environment for genetic risk disclosure, build a web or app-based portal to promote return results, and collaborate on studies that can demonstrate that genetic risk disclosure can transform patient care. If we're successful, we can do something really powerful. Identify a subgroup of patients who are born with a high genetic risk for heart attack and help them overcome their genetic destiny. And in so doing, position ourselves as industry leaders in the rapidly growing field of personal genomics. Thank you.